Okay, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> okay, now uh, let's uh, start with where we stopped last time. Uh, so, what we are doing in chapter number three, we are uh, studying uh, uh, one dimensional steady state conduction. Okay, so we are studying conduction, but uh, only one dimensional and steady state. Uh, for that, uh, we initially started solving the uh, heat, heat diffusion equation and first we solve the heat diffusion equation for for the case uh, without internal heat generation yes. okay so so without internal heat generation we did it for rectangular coordinates then we did it for cylindrical coordinates spherical coordinates the results are there but we did not do ourselves okay uh, then uh, we we modified uh, Then we modified it a bit, okay, and uh, uh, we added the internal heat generation. Then we added the internal heat generation, and uh, uh, after we added the internal heat generation, we again solved for the case of rectangular coordinates. For cylindrical coordinates, we did not solve, but the end result was given and was said that you can do it yourself the same way and uh, similarly for the spherical coordinates. So now we are done with this and we move towards uh, the next stage. The next stage is uh, uh, heat transfer from extended surfaces. Okay. Uh, now in heat transfer from extended surfaces, first you need to understand the basic idea behind it. Why we are doing it? Okay. What is the need for, a, for an extended surface? Okay, uh, you know that uh, the formula for heat transfer is Q is equals to uh, Q is equals to U A delta T. Mm -hmm. This is the formula for overall heat transfer. Oh. Overall heat transfer. Okay. Now, ma in many applications, what happens is that if we want to increase the heat transfer. Heat transfer is dependent upon three things here. Heat transfer is dependent upon overall heat transfer coefficient. Heat transfer is dependent upon the area. And heat transfer is dependent upon the temperature difference. Many times we are really constrained. We are really constrained with the temperature difference. For example, if we are rejecting heat to the outside. Okay? Now outside temperature is atmospheric temperature. You cannot do anything about it. It's fixed. It's not in your control. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even if you want to increase the heat transfer, delta T is not really the area where you can make much significant change. You, you can't really increase Q that much just by changing delta T because delta T is not in your control. And similarly, in many applications, uh, U this is the overall heat transfer coefficient. It is also not in much, much in your control. Yeah, you, dep it depends upon what fluid and what type of heat exchange is going through. I mean, uh, what are the conditions of, is it a forced convection heat transfer? Is it a natural convection heat transfer? Okay, then uh, what kind of fluid is it? Are you doing heat transfer in, in air? Are you doing heat transfer in the liquid? Okay, suppose, you, you are doing heat transfer with air and you know for air the overall heat transfer coefficient is very less compared to the liquid. Okay? You cannot change air from liquid. We are living in air. So literally U is also a parameter in many times we are really constrained. We cannot do anything about it. We cannot increase the heat transfer by changing U. It's not in our control. So the only thing left for us in order to increase the heat transfer is by changing A. Okay? So many times A is the only thing. So if we for so 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 if, if if a body has to reject heat or the heat has to be supplied, okay, and uh, if you are constrained with delta T, you cannot change delta T that much. You are constrained with U, you cannot change U that much. So then it's all about A. You can increase or decrease the area in the, at the designing stage. So by increasing the area considerably, heat transfer will increase. Okay? So that is, this is, the, that is the reason why do we actually put an extended surface. 
Okay? So that is the reason why do we put most of the time extended surface. Uh, a very common extended surface, if you see, have you, have you ever seen a motor attached with a pump? If you see the covering of the motor, the covering of the motor is like number of plates attached on it. There are many plates which are attached on a circular motor it's casing. Okay? And all those plates act as fins, as an extended surface. Now, why do we need to attach them? Because whenever the, you, you place a motor, we place motor at many different places, not necessarily there is wind blowing over it. So it's natural convection which is going through. Natural convection has a very low heat transfer coefficient. You cannot do about anything about it. Okay? And it is normally rejecting heat to the air. So motor is normally placed in the normal environment, in the ambient air. So you cannot change the air as well. You cannot replace all the air with water or any other fluid. Okay? So, so if, if the heat transfer area is less, what will happen? Heat transfer will be less. If the heat transfer will be less, what will happen? The casing of the motor will become hot and hot and hot because it cannot transfer heat at that much rate with which it is getting heat. Okay, so it will start getting he heated up more, 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 more. First of all, it will be dangerous for anybody because it is placed in an open environment. Anybody can touch it, can injure himself, harm himself. On the other hand, its temperature might rise to the level that it would damage the casing, might be meltdown, might be deshaping of the casing. Okay, so we need to reject heat, and we are constrained with delta T. We are constrained with U. And the only way is that we put fins so that we increase the area such that the amount of heat transfer would occur in a way that its temperature might not, might not rise to the level where it can damage the motor itself. Okay. Anyway, this is one of the examples. There are many examples there around. Okay. So that is the main reason why we add extended surfaces. We need to increase heat transfer. Heat transfer increase. Many times it's not possible. We're constrained because of the delta T and U. And the only thing left in our hand is the A. Okay? So, thank you. Shukriya. Okay. So the thing is that we have a body, okay? We have a body and it is rejecting heat. Okay? But we want more heat to be rejected. So what we do is that we need to add a fin. So we add a rod like or, or any shape, weld, connect to this body. And now the heat transfer will also, so, so part of the heat from the body will be conducted in it. And heat transfer will also take place from the surface of this additional body attached to the main body. So this acts as an extended surface, okay? It was not a part of this body. It was just made to be a part of this body to increase the heat transfer area, so that the heat transfer might increase. Is it clear? Either to reject the heat, sometimes to gain the heat. Because even for gaining the heat, you need a surface area over which heat can, can go in, okay? If the surface area is less, how much heat can go in? Okay, so sometimes you need to increase the surface area so that more heat can go in. Okay, so it's both way around. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So that is the main purpose, that is the main reason why do we need an extended surface. And these extended surfaces are known as fins. Okay, now there are many different kinds of fins. Let's first talk about them. We have straight fins. Now what are straight fins? If we have a plate, if we have a plate and we need to add a fin to it, so we can add a fin which is all across the length. It's like a plate. Okay? So these are known as straight fins. Straight. Straight fins means all across the length. Okay? We can have a straight fin with uniform cross section. So uniform cross-section means at any, at any cross-section, 
the the cross sectional area is same so that means this it's it's a rectangular cross section that's uniform it's not changing with x so you move at any x the cross section is same or we can have a non -cro non uniform cross section for example the 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 triangular straight fin so at any x the value of the cross sectional area is, will change is it clear so we, you can have um, straight fins with uniform cross section, or you can have straight fins with uh, non-uniform cross section. Triangular cross section is one of an example of non-uniform cross section. You can also have a concave or a con convex cross section. So, so this is one cross section. You can have uh, one cross section like this. There's a concave cross section, triangular concave. You can have a convex cross section. Okay, like this. Anyways, these, these are all straight fins. The uniform, non-uniform cross section. Okay, then we can have a fin. Let's say if it is not a plate, suppose if you have a tube. Now on a tube, you want to put the fin. So in that case, you cannot have a straight fin. Okay, so, so we, we have another, yeah, we can also have a straight fin. Suppose if we put a plate like this on the tube. That's, that will be straight fins. But suppose if we don't want to put straight fin, we want to put across the, the periphery, across the circumference, okay? Then in that case, we need to put an annular fin. This is known as annular fin, okay? So annular fin is what? It's like a ring which is inserted over the tube, okay? So this is an additional area. This is an extended surface from the tube, okay? So what kind of fin is this? This is annular fin. These two were the straight fins. Then th uh, there is a third kind of fin, which is, which is a pin fin. Pin fin is what? Now you have, you have the complete surface, but you don't put a fin across the complete length. You just put a fin at one point. It's like a pin, okay, pin connection. So pin connection, the difference is that pin is not across the complete length. It is at one point, okay. So that's a pin fin. Now pin fin can also be of a uniform cross section. It could be of a non-uniform cross section. Okay. So these are basically three, four types of fins. We have straight fins, annular fins, pin fins. Now in the straight and pin fin, you can have uniform cross section, non-uniform cross section. Is it clear? Okay. Now in order to analyze the heat transfer through this extended surface, in order to analyze the heat transfer through the extended surface, what we do is that we apply the thin film approximation. What does thin film approximation mean? Well, thin film approximation means we assume that our extended surface, our fin, has very small thickness. It's very thin, okay? So very small thickness means at any cross section, there is no temperature gradient inside. What is the temperature at the top is the same as the temperature at the bottom as the same is the same as the temperature at any point. Okay? So we are assuming that there is no temperature gradient within the fin at any cross section. Okay? Temperature might vary if you change x, but at one x at one value of x at that one cross section there is no change in temperature across the length of the cross section. Okay? So this is the thin film approximation. Obviously, in reality, there is a still a little change. Yeah, yeah. But that change is really not that significant. Yes, there will be a little error in your analysis, but that error is acceptable. Uh, and your, your analysis is still 99.9% .9 correct. Okay? So why do we make approximations? Normally, in engineering, we make approximations to make our life easy. Okay, sometimes there, there is a certain level of error which is acceptable to us. And if it is acceptable to us, then, then if we do not make that approximation, our life becomes very, very difficult. Because the, 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 the solution of the problem becomes so complicated that it's not really worth the time to spend that much. Is it clear? So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, then that means gaining the heat uh, more quickly? Uh, no, it does not mean it's gaining heat more quickly. It means that 
across the cross section there is no temperature gradient. So whatever the amount of heat uh, uh, conducted will be convected out from the top and the bottom. Uh, at the same value. At the same value, at the same rate. Yeah, so there is conduction in the surface but there is no storage. Okay, there is no storage within the fin. This is what we assume. Is it clear? So fin itself is not posing any resistance. Okay. We can make it on both sides. It we must can. be di uh, direct to the, to the lead or to the temperature. Yeah, it must be. It must be in contact with, this, with, with the medium with which it is transferring heat. Okay. Otherwise, uh, it does not matter. Otherwise, you lose its significance. You lose its importance. Okay. It, ha it must increase the heat transfer area. Is it clear? So far. Is it, is it clear? Do you have anything? You have any question? Okay. Now let's uh, analyze the heat transfer through a fin. Now let's analyze a heat transfer through a fin. Now suppose you have a body. This is your main body, and from the main body you attach a fin. This is your fin. Dash, okay. Now what happens is that heat from the main body will be conducted to the fin. Okay. So if I take a, a, at a, any cross section, suppose I take this cross section. Suppose I take this cross section. So what happens is that there will be amount of heat conducted in to that surface. And then from this surface there will be amount of heat conducted out plus amount of heat conduct convected out from the sides. Yeah, hmm? the radiation? Uh, we have, we have right now we are neglecting radiation. Okay. Just convection component, okay? So, so the thing is that if the heat flow direction is like this, if the heat flow direction is like this, so the, at any cross section there is amount of heat conducted in is equals to the amount of heat conducted out plus amount of heat convected out. Is it clear? The conducted out will be from the cross section. Convected out will be from the surface, from the circumference. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So convection is done from the circumference, but the conduction is done within the body, okay, across the cross section. Is it clear? So, so if I want to write the first law of thermodynamics, as per the first law of thermodynamics, that means the energy balance. Whenever we say first law of thermodynamics, it means the energy balance. So if you write, if we want to write the equation of energy balance over this surface, so it will be what? It will be Qx, suppose at location x, this is in x direction, suppose at, at, at x, Qx is entering in, is equals to Qx plus dx, after, after dx distance, okay, so, so qx plus dx will be conducted out plus q convection. Is it clear? Yes. So qx, this, this is energy into the surface, then this is energy out from the surface, okay. Now the thing is that we can substitute the values, okay. If we substitute the values from the Fourier's law and the Fourier expansion, we place it in here and the Q convection, we end up with this result, okay. Now this is actually done in my own handwriting here. So let's follow it, what we did. You see the same equation here, Qx equals to Qx plus dx plus dq convection. This is the same equation here. So Qx plus Qx plus dx plus dq. It's a differential element. So differential amount of heat con convected out. Okay. Now Qx is basically what? Qx is if if you, if you know that uh, Qx is the conduction here, and the conduction is represented by the Fourier's law, which is negative k a dt by dx. Okay. A a here I write here ac. Ac means cross-sectional area. 
which area will be considered for conduction, the area across which heat is being transferred perpendicular to that. That's a cross-sectional area here, right? Now, as per the Fourier, Fourier expansion, we discussed that before as well, okay? So for Fourier expansion, if you have Qx plus dx, we write it as Qx plus dava Qx upon dava x dx. That's the Fourier expansion for Qx plus dx, okay? So now we just substitute the value. Qx is negative Kac dt by dx plus dava by dava x qx. So if you differentiate dava by dava x by qx, so k, k can come out from the differential element. Then d by d, dx, ac dt by dx, whole multiply by dx. So this is this term. This term will be what? Dava by dava x, uh, negative k ac dt by dx but k can come out, okay? So if we take the k and negative k out, then it become this thing, okay? So this thing multiplied by dx, okay? So we get this thing, okay? Plus q convection, q convection is ha delta t, but this is from the differential element, so we will have a will be the differential area, okay? ha delta t, but which area is this? This is not the cross-sectional area. Convection is taking place from the surface, okay? So convection is not taking place from this area, it's taking from the surface. So that's the surface area, that's why we represent it as AS. Just to differentiate between AC and AS, these two are different areas. Okay, if you substitute these values here, this term will be cancelled by this term, okay? And uh, if you divide the whole equation by KAC dx, okay? then you'll end up with this thing. This is the differential equation for an extended surface. Heat transfer from an extended surface. One dimensional heat transfer considered, okay? So we have d squared t by dx squared plus one upon ac means cross-sectional area, dac by dx. dac by dx, what does this mean? That means change in the cross-sectional area with length. So that means change in the cross-sectional area with length, but that means if the cross-sectional area is not changing with length, I mean uniform cross-section, it's not changing with x, then this will be zero. So for uniform cross-section, this term will go to zero. But if it is not uniform cross-section, like the, the three ones that we draw, I tried to rub, but it did not rub, okay? So, so the three ones, if, it is, if the cross-section is changing with x, then this term will be there. Is it clear? Yes. Then we have this, this means one upon AC. AC is the cross-sectional area. H, you know, is a convection uh, divided by K. K is the conduction within the body, okay? Uh, DAS by DX, what is this thing? So it's surface area divided by x. So surface area is this surface, the outer surface, yeah. per unit x. It becomes the parameter, yeah. right? Yeah. Surface area per unit length. So that means if you take just at any section. So that's the parameter. There's just the parameter, outer body, okay? So we represent it by p. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is uniform, but it is, it is basically a length. It's not now an area, it's a length. Parameter is a length. Uh, parameter. parameter is a length, right? So you have, you had the surface area, but divide by the, the length, it becomes just a length, which is a parameter, okay? So we represent it by P, T, T minus T infinity is equals to zero. So this becomes our uh, fundamental equation for heat transfer within an extended surface, okay? So remember, how did we start it? We started with first uh, making the energy balance, first law of thermodynamics, energy in equals to energy out, then we substituted the values from the Fourier's law, 
And then we just made a little simplification, and that's it. We come up with this. How do you divide by the index function of uh, k? K a c d x. Yeah. I just uh, simplify it a little. Okay. Now we need to solve this this formula. Okay, this differential formula. Okay, let's uh, move ahead. Okay, so suppose if you have a fin of uniform cross section. Suppose if you have a fin of uniform cross section, so this term will go to zero. Okay, so you have just this thing minus this thing equals to zero, right? So we got this equation. Okay. We got this, this equation d squared t upon dx squared plus h p p I told you what is p. p. P is the parameter because it was d a s upon d x okay over k a c into t minus t infinity equals to 0. Now this is a differential equation and in the course of differential equations you might have seen the solution for it. You remember if you had this kind of equation how do we represent it? This is the general form solution d squared theta upon dx squared plus m squared theta equals to 0. Then the solution becomes like this, c1 e raised to the power mx plus c2 e raised to the power negative mx. Recalling something? Okay. And then this m square is basically this term. This term will be the m square. Now why do we take it m square? It's not something related to heat and mass transfer. It's something related to differential equations. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that detail. Even we are not going to do the solution here. We're just going, going to have the end result with us. But solution you can understand based upon your understanding in the course of differential equations. Okay. Obviously, it's a second-order differential equation, so we need boundary conditions. Is it clear? We need boundary conditions. Now here, in this equation, uh, now from now on, we are going to write temperature in terms of theta. Okay. So what is theta? Theta means t minus t infinity. T infinity is the mean, mean stream temperature of the air. Okay, for convection. Okay, that's the air temperature. Okay, so theta equals to t minus t infinity. So if I say theta L, that means at point L, temperature is T L minus T infinity. Okay? If I say theta naught, that means T naught minus T infinity. Okay? If I say theta is equals to zero, what does this mean? Tell me. If I say theta is equals to zero, that means t is equals to. If I say theta is equals to zero, that means t is equals to. T equals to t infinity. If I, if I say theta is equals to zero, then t becomes t infinity. Oh, maybe I did not hear you <laughs> say like that. So theta equals to t infinity. Uh, so t equals to t infinity. If theta is zero, okay. Okay. So anyway, so we put t minus t infinity as theta, and then is, since we want to solve, what 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 is our objective whenever we are solving the heat diffusion equations? Our objective is to find t as a function of x, right? T as a function of x. This is our objective. Now, since we are putting t as a function of theta, so actually now we want theta as a function of x. Right, so this becomes the equation where theta is a function of x. We want to find out, and okay, and uh, we now need to put. Uh, uh, we now need to put the okay. Uh, whenever we have uh, an extended surface, a fin attached to the main body, so the temperature of the main body is main body is known as base. And the temperature of the main body is will be known as temperature of the base, right? So theta b will be what? Theta b will be t b minus t infinity. Okay. 
So theta b is tb minus t infinity. Since we are putting all temperature in terms of the theta, so instead of saying tb, we will say theta b, but theta b means tb minus t infinity. Okay. Uh, for the case of a fin, we always consider that the value of x starts from the base and this is the tip, from the base to the tip. So at base, x is equals to 0. Mm -hmm. And at the tip, x is equals to L, if the length of the fin yes. is L. Is it clear? So most of the time, when we are solving the case of, uh, of a fin, as I told you, since this is a second order differential equation, we need two boundary conditions. And one boundary condition, most of the time, we know. And that is, at the base, the base yeah. what is the temperature? Because we know the temperature of the main body. So one boundary condition is known. However, we need another boundary condition. That, because we need two boundary conditions to solve this. One is the temperature of the base. This is known. So one boundary condition is very simple. This is known. But the other boundary condition, there are many options what we can take as other boundary condition. And, as, and, and, and from, from whatever we have studied so far, you know that if we change the boundary condition, then the solution changes. Yes. We need to prove that. Yeah. If we change the boundary condition, the solution changes. So now we have this equation, and we need two boundary conditions. One boundary condition is fixed, which is the, the base temperature. Okay. But the other boundary condition, for, but for the other boundary condition, we have many options. And if we change the option, then the solution will change, right? So now you have, we are not going, go, we are not going to go through the solution, but we have the end results. So one boundary condition is there at the base. Other boundary condition we place at the tip. We call this at the tip, okay? Now, if we consider the tip condition, tip is at x is equals to L. If we consider the tip condition as a convective heat transfer, so that means if what our second boundary condition is that the amount of heat conducted is equals to the amount of heat convected. Yeah. Okay? So yeah. Yeah. So what we say is that at the tip, the amount of heat conducted yeah. is equals to the amount of heat convected yeah. Yeah. from the tip. What kind of boundary condition is that? You have studied three kinds of boundary conditions. It's no, not Richlet, it's not Newman. The third it's, the, it's the boundary condition of third kind. Yeah. Where the amount of heat conducted is equal to amount of heat convected. You don't know the temperature here, you don't know the heat flux here, but we know that the amount of heat conducted is equal to amount of heat convected. Now, if this is the condition, so now you know two boundary conditions. The first is the Dritchlet type, where you know the temperature of the base. And the second is the boundary condition of third kind. If you have this case, then you can find theta as a function of x. Okay. So here, in, instead of putting theta as a function of s, uh, x, they have put theta upon theta b. Theta upon theta b becomes dimensionless. So theta upon theta b will be what? Theta upon theta b. Theta is t minus t infinity. Theta b will be t b minus t infinity. But this will be in Kelvin. This will be in Kelvin. Kelvin upon Kelvin cancels unitless. Okay. It's normally uh, more suitable to represent everything in the unitless form. Okay. It's like ratios. Okay. So now instead of finding theta as a function of x, they have find theta upon theta b as a function of x. So that it, this becomes unitless as a function of x. Okay? So when they found it for this case, the answer comes this. Oh, it's a very complicated answer. This is the temperature distribution. A temperature distribution. Not theta as a function of x, but theta upon theta b as a function of x. Okay? Now, can somebody read it? What's written? It's not cos, it's cosh. You know, hyperbolic function. Okay? So 
So you have hyperbolic function, m, l minus x, and what is m? m is written here. m is square is equals to hp upon kac. It's, you remember, we put m square as hp upon kac, okay? Plus h upon mk sine hyperbolic m l minus x divided by cos hyperbolic m l plus h upon m k sine hyperbolic m l, okay? So it's, it's a complicated formula, but it is for theta as a fun theta upon theta b as function of x, okay? Once you know that, you can find what is the heat transfer from the fin. Okay, heat transfer from the fin here is capital M. Capital M is different from small m. Capital M has the value HPKAC under root theta b. Okay, so capital M is H, HPKAC all in multiplication under root multiplied by theta b. Okay, so this is capital M. Capital M multiplied by this term. So that's the heat transfer. This is the temperature distribution. It's complicated, but this table will be is provided to you in the book of tables. Okay? So anyways, however this result comes because we assume that at the tip it is the boundary condition of third kind. Is it clear? Yes. Now suppose if we consider that it is not the boundary condition of third kind at the tip. But at the tip, if, it, if we suppose it is adiabatic, what does adiabatic tip means? Adiabatic tip means that there is, n there is an insulation here and there is no heat conducted, convected out. So condition is equal to zero. Yeah. So, so that means temperature gradient at that position is zero. Okay. So there is no heat convected out. That's an adiabatic tip. If you assume that, then our temperature distribution becomes this. Becomes simple, a little. Okay, and the heat and the fin heat transfer becomes this. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So what is the thing changing? We are just changing the tip condition. Okay, one of the boundary condition is for the base. That's fixed. So the temperature of the base is known. But the other condition is for the tip. Okay, now third way, the, now third possibility is that it's a Dirichlet type condition. Suppose if we know theta equals to theta L, suppose if we know what is the temperature at the tip. Suppose at the tip temperature is T L. Mm -hmm. If we know the temperature that, that, that the tip temperature is T L, that means theta is equals to at L is theta L. Theta L is T L minus T infinity. So suppose we know TL means we know theta L. Okay, so that's a Dirichlet type, Dirichlet type of condition. If this is the boundary condition that we put, then our answer becomes this for the temperature distribution, and that will be the heat transfer. We just change the boundary condition at the tip. Is it clear? So, so, so now you know two temperatures. You know temperature at the base and you know temperature at the tip. Okay? Theta or the You say theta or t, it's the same thing. Theta is t minus t infinity. So if you know t, that means you know theta. So normally we put t's in terms of theta now. Is it clear? Get used to it. Is it clear so far or not? Yes, okay. Okay, now we have the fourth condition. Now in the fourth, fourth type of condition, we assume that our fin is of infinite length. Okay. When we say that the fin is infinite length, okay, look, what happened is that our base, suppose our base is at 100 degrees centigrade. As you move away from the base, the temperature at any cross section will differ, okay? And it should decrease. Suppose if the ambient is 25 degrees centigrade, and the base is at 100 degrees centigrade, so here it is 100. Here it is 100, because it will transfer heat out. At the same time, it is conducting and convecting. Okay, so here it is 100, here it is maybe 90, here it is maybe 80, 70, maybe 60, 50, 
40. And if the fin is infinite length, if the fin is infinite length, what will happen in the end? Not be close to zero. It's close to the temperature of t infinity. Yeah, theta will be close to zero. Theta will be close to zero, but the temperature of the tip will become close to the air, almost same as air. Is it clear? So that means our theta is zero because t becomes yeah, yeah. equal to t, t infinity. Yeah, yeah. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theta becomes zero and t becomes equal to t infinity. Okay. But t will, will be uh, uh, equal to the air. Hmm? air the, the, the value of t will be equal to the air. Will be equal to the temperature of the air. At the tip. Yeah, yeah, at the tip. At the, at, the tip. The at the end of the tip. If we have infinite length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So if this if we have infinite length, then it becomes length goes infinite, it becomes a singularity problem. In mathematics you have seen singularity problems, right? Have you seen yeah. singularities yeah. problem? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyways, singularity problems have different kind of solutions. So anyways, you go through the solution for the singularity problem. This becomes the answer. So that's the temperature distribution, e raised to the power negative mx. And that's the heat transfer. It's M, capital M only. Is it clear? Yes. So we, we develop the heat diffusion equation for the extended surface, which is the fin. And from the heat diffusion equation, we have to put the two boundary condition. One boundary condition is at the base, which is known. Other boundary condition is at the tip. At the tip, we keep on changing the boundary condition, and our answer keep on changing. First time, we put the boundary condition as a boundary condition of third kind. Then we put the uh, adiabatic boundary condition. Adiabatic boundary condition is kind of a Newman boundary condition. Because in Newman boundary condition, you know the heat flux. Yeah. Here in this case, it is zero. But we know the heat flux. It's zero. Okay. Then we have the Dritchlet type of boundary condition where we know the temperature at the tip. And then the finally, we consider its infinite length. So from the infinite length, we assume that the theta is zero. It's, it's also kind of a Dritchlet boundary condition because we know theta is zero. Mm. right? We know temperature. Anyways, you see the table here. Which case seems the simplest? Last one. Last one, right? Last one seems the most simplest one. Very simple answer. Okay, but the problem with the last one is that it is done by assuming infinite length of the fin. In reality, we do not have infinite length. We need the length. Okay? So this is simplest, but in reality, we cannot use it directly. It's not practical to use it directly. Okay? So that's not practical. Okay, now el eliminate part, well, the, the, the fourth option, D option, okay? Compare between A, B, C. Which one is the simplest? B seems simpler. B seems simpler. Okay. Okay. Now, what we do is that it is simpler compared to this one and this one. Okay. So we can compare. We can we we can transform the other cases into this one. How? So what we do is that we know that this is our fin. Suppose we know this is our fin, and as per the adiabatic tip. We, in order to use the second case, adiabatic tip case, insulation. we have to consider that there is insulation here and there is no heat transfer from the tip. Okay. Now, suppose we want to use the first case. In the first case, there is heat transfer from the tip. Yes. There is heat transfer from the tip. But what we do is that we have the length of the fin. Okay. If we increase the length of the fin slightly, such that if we increase the length of the fin slightly, such that the amount of heat transfer which was supposed to be from the tip is done by the length. So we increase the length from L to slight more increase in length. Okay. So now we can assume that the tip is adiabatic and amount of heat transfer which was supposed to be from the tip is now done from the length. Okay, let me use the good marker. Maybe this one. 
Oh, this is much worse. Okay. You mean that if you, if you this one. Okay. okay. So this is the length of the fin. This is fixed, doctor, right? Length of the fin, fin is fixed. Okay. okay. Now, if we want to use the first case, so in case of the first case, there is heat transfer yes. from the tip. Okay. But I don't want to use this formula. This formula is too complicated. It's the case A I want to solve, but I don't want to use the formula for case A. Case A I want to solve, but I don't want to use the formula for case A. Now I want to use the formula for case B, but I have case A. I have case A, but I want to use the formula for case B. So now what I can do is that, now in case B, you have length L here. Instead of using L, I will use here LC, where LC is the corrected length. And in the corrected length, we assume that this L, LC is basically L plus tip. So it's, it's now LC, which is, e so it's now LC, which is equals to L plus, we assume that it is a slightly yeah, yeah, larger, the, slightly larger to accommodate the tip heat transfer. Okay, so now instead of putting L, if I put here LC, so now I can use the adiabatic to solve this one. But you got it? That's mean, in reality, it is still L. Yeah. But in formulation, instead of putting length L, we put length LC, which is slightly greater than L, in order to accommodate for the tip. So now I can assume in my head that the tip is adiabatic. Because the amount of heat transfer from the tip is now compensated in the length. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? So th in this way, I will use part B to solve A case. Is it clear? Yeah. And our, my, my answer would be reasonably accurate. Because I'm not using directly the length L. I'm using LC, corrected length where I made a little correction in the length, just in order to accommodate the heat transfer from the tip. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So now I can use this formula and you can use, I can use this formula. Because here we also have L instead of L if we use LC, good. Here we also have L, L if we, instead of L if we use LC, that's good. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So anyways, this is about uh, solution of the problems and using the formulas. Now let's move over to a numerical related to it. Okay. Do you understand till here what we did? Yes. Okay. Let's try to solve example 3.9. Each and every word in the problem statement is important. Okay. So let's start. A very long rod, length given or not? What's, what's the length? A very long rod, five millimeter in diameter. Five millimeter is the diameter. Where is the length given? It says very long, but does this specify the length? So what would be the case we are talking about? If infinite length. A very thin film means no thickness. A very long rod means length is not given, infinite length. Is it clear? Each and every word is important. So long means many things. Okay? <laughs> long decides that what kind of case you are dealing with. Is it case A, B, C or D? A very long rod, 5 millimeter in diameter, has one end maintained at 100 degrees centigrade. Obviously, this is a very long rod and one end will be attached to the base. So the base temperature is given, right? So this is, this is TB, base temperature, right? Uh, the surface of the rod is exposed to ambient air at 25 degrees centigrade. So that's T infinity. T infinity is given. 25 degrees centigrade. So this is a very long road at the base 100 degrees centigrade and in the air which is at 25 degrees centigrade. 
with a convection coefficient with the convection heat transfer coefficient of 100 watt per meter square Kelvin. So H is given. Is it clear? Determine the temperature distribution along the rod. So we need to find temperature distribution. Okay. So temperature distribution means we need to find T as a function of X, right? But normally we don't have things in terms of T, we have things in terms of theta. And in the table it is theta upon theta B as a function of X, right? So determine the temperature distribution along rods constructed from pure copper. So the material is given. If the rod is from pure copper or aluminum alloy or type AISI 316 stainless steel. So we have to solve the problem three times. One time assuming it is made of copper, other time assuming it is made of aluminum oil, third time assuming it is made up of stainless steel. Okay, these terms are important, 2024 aluminum alloy, because in the aluminum alloy you have two, three, four types. Similarly, in the stainless steel you have many other types. So the type is AISI 316. What are the corresponding heat losses? That's the heat loss, Q. So in the table, two things were given, temperature distribution and heat loss. Yes. And these are the two things we need to find. Okay, what are the corresponding heat losses from the rods? Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Now let's go back to the table. That's the table. So which case we I need to use? D. D. Because it's a very long length rod. Okay. So temperature distribution will be theta upon theta B is equals to E raised to the power mx. Right? Or I can say that T, theta is equals to theta b into yes. e raised to the power negative mx. Yes. Or I can say that t minus t infinity is equals to t b minus t infinity yeah. e raised to the power negative mx. Yes. Or I can say t is equals to t infinity plus t b minus t infinity into e raised to the power negative mx. Is it clear? Yes. So now I know what is t as a function of x. x okay. T infinity is known. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. TB is known. Base temperature was 100. T infinity. T infinity known. X, I need to find T as a function of X. Yeah. So I don't need to find X. Okay? Right. Talk about this M. M is equals to uh, HP upon KAC K under root, yeah. right? No, no, sorry. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. M, 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 M is this, yes. right? Yes. HP upon KAC under root, okay? Now, do we know H? Yes, yes. given. It was given. Yes. H was given, okay? Parameter, do we know parameter? Yes, no, no. Look, if I have a circular rod, what is the parameter of a circular rod? Yeah, I know there is this thing, but what's the parameter of a circular rod? So it's a circular rod, if I see from here, that's a circle. Parameter of a circle is what? Two pi r. Yeah, two pi r. Two pi r is the parameter of a circle. So if, I, if you have a circle, what is the length of this circle? It's pi d or two pi r, right? So that's the parameter of a circular rod. So instead of P, let me write here pi D. We know the diameter. Okay. Uh, K is for the material. Yes. Yes. Now we have to first solve it for copper, then we have to solve for, for aluminium, then we have to solve for stainless steel. So we need to find the K for the three materials. But when you go into the table, you have to search for the temperature as well. At which temperature you need to find K. Okay. Now, which temperature you will use here? Yes. You have the base at 100 degrees centigrade, and you have the air temperature at 25 degrees centigrade. But you know that your fin is neither at 100, is nor at 25. Your fin is in between the two temperatures. So you take the mean, average, 2500. Average of 25 and 100. Consider that the mean temperature over which you will find the values of K. Good? 
Is it clear? Yes. So you see here, so it's they consider Tb plus T infinity over 2. That's the temperature they used to find out the values of of K and for, for copper, for aluminium, for stainless steel. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So the K, K issue is solved here as well. Now tell me what will be the formula for AC? Uh, cross section area. What's the formula for AC? Not plus no, D no, square. Multiply pi by 4 d square. Okay, so I substitute here AC is pi by 4 d square. Okay, pi pi will cancel here, 1 d will cancel with this, and 4 I can take it on the, on the top side. Okay, so we have 4 h upon kd, right? 4 h upon kd. Now we know everything. So just solve the, just put the value of k for copper get the value of m, substitute value of m here, you get an equation t as a function of x. Yes. Similarly, you can get t as a function of x for aluminum. Similarly, you can get t as a function of x for stainless steel. Okay, this is finding t as a function of x. This is done here. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's, what's about uh, fin heat rate, heat transfer rate, heat loss? It's capital M. And capital M is H, P, K, A, C, theta, B. You know theta, B. Yes. You know A, C. You know K, K, you know P, you know, you know H, you know everything. What is? Theta B. Theta B is TB minus T infinity. TB is known 100 degree. T infinity is known 25 degree. Is it clear? Yes. So you know everything in it. So you can solve the say only the thing is that K will change. One, one time for copper, one time for aluminium, one time for stainless steel. So you will solve three times this for heat transfer, three times this for temperature distribution. And part one is done. Is it clear? Yes. How do we solve part one? And now it will so that's part one. It is done. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Now let's move towards part two. Part two is interesting. See, estimate how long the rods must be for the assumption of infinite length. Read this statement, estimate how long the rods must be for infinite length. How long the rods must be for infinite length. Does this make any sense? So, uh, doctor, the, it must be zero, doctor. The, the temperature uh, minus the temperature because the size of not, no? It's, it's true, uh, to partially you are correct, partially you are correct. Anyways, the thing is that we need to find length. We need to find the length for infinite length case, okay? So it's an infinite length case, but what does infinite means here? Infinite, if we mean infinite means very long. No length is, can be specified. But in reality, infinite still means something. Okay. Now the thing is that if we use part four for infinite length case, there is no L here. There is no L in the formula. Okay. So, so really, we cannot use the infinite length case. But um, in the adiabatic case, there is L here. Okay. We can use the adiabatic case to find the length. Now, our case is in finite L, but we want to use it for adiabatic, right? So for the heat transfer, for the heat transfer, this is the formula for infinite length case, and this is the formula for adiabatic case. These two formulas could be same if tan hyperbolic ML becomes equals to one. Right? If we make tan hyperbolic ML equals to 1, then this is the same as this case. Right? So let's try to solve for this. If we, if we put tan hyperbolic ML equals to 1, that means ML equals to tan inverse hyperbolic 1. Right? 
Do you, anybody has calculator? Can can you solve for it? Find out tan hyperbolic inverse one is what? Tan is equal to the length of the angle. Hmm? It's not length, it's not angle, it's it's an operation it's or just yeah. Can you make tan hyper tan hyperbolic inverse? Why? Show me show me the calculator. Okay, so we have um, uh, hyperbolic function is where you, you see here hype written. Okay, so if I click hype, it's come the option tan hyperbolic. Okay, but I need tan hyperbolic inverse. It's six, number six. Okay, if I put here, so it's tan hyperbolic inverse one math error. That's a singularity problem. Tan hyperbolic inverse one will give you an error. Because its answer is infinity. Okay? So you cannot solve for tan inverse hyperbolic one. Cannot solve for it. So what we do is that, okay, okay, I got it. We cannot make m equals to this thing. Because in order to make this equals to this thing, we have to put tan hyperbolic ml equals to one. Let's not put it one, we put it 0.99. Okay, one gives you singularity case where it will be, be infinite. Let's solve it for tan hyperbolic ML 0.99. So that means tan hyperbolic inverse 0.99. 2.64. So that means if I say ML equals to 2.64, so the length will be 2.64 upon M. This length could be considered as an infinite length. Is it clear? Yeah. This length, L equals to 2.64 divided by M, this length, whatever it comes, could be considered as an infinite length. Greater than that is obviously infinite, but this could be considered as infinite. So even if you solve it, no, it will not be trillion. <laughs> if, if you solve it, we'll find out that it's, it, it's, it's a reasonable number. It's not really that much big, okay? But that length could be considered at infinite for this case. But why when you put one, you don't get the answer? Because this is actually infinite. You see, these are basically uh, exponential curves. You know exponential curve, yeah. how they look like? They look like, like this, okay? So after a slight change from this to this, yeah. they will be infinite, okay? So you go one slide down and you have a finite value. If you go one slide up, that's infinite. There's a hyperbolic curve, well, exponential curve. They are like this, okay? So tan inverse one, hyperbolic inverse, uh, tan hyperbolic inverse one was actually infinite. Literally no number, okay? But if you go slightly less, you will get a number. But that number could be considered as a reasonable approximation for infinite length. Is it clear? Okay, so, so that is the length. We wanted to find the length for infinite length case. So that is the length for infinite length case. We can also find the temperature distribution for infinite length case. For temperature distribution for an infinite length case, we have, uh, uh, if we have infinite length case, that means uh, uh, theta upon theta b uh, is equals to what? equals to should be equals to zero. For infinite length, what we assumed? We assume theta is zero, right? Yes. For infinite length, we assume theta, theta is zero, right? So if theta is zero, that means theta upon theta b is zero. That means e raised to be power negative mx should be zero, right? That should be zero. E should be power, e is power negative mx should be zero. So if we solve this, so that means if we put this as length L, now if we solve for L, for this case, mm. then the value of L that you get is, an, is the length for an infinite length for the temperature distribution case. Okay. So if we solve this, 
is done here. So if we solve this, OK. If you put e to the power negative ml equals to 0, it's not possible to solve. Again, this is an infinite case. So it's not possible to solve. Again, this is an infinite case. So what we do is that instead of putting it as 0, we put as 0 0.01. Like we like we did, yes, in, yes. okay. Just so that it has, it becomes solvable, and you get an length. And then when you solve it, so that was 2.65 or 2.64, as you said. And now this comes out to be 4.6. So if you want to get a temperature distribution, okay, at a length 4.6 divided by m temperature would approximately be equal to the ambient temperature. Almost 99.9% .9 equal. Okay, And if you want to take the length, the heat transfer, based on the heat transfer case, so the heat transfer for this length, 2.65 divided by m, this much length heat transfer would be approximate for the heat transfer case if the tip is adiabatic. Okay, for infinite length. So this length will make a heat transfer equal to an infinite length. So if you have an infinite length, long, long length, that length will make heat transfer equal to this much amount of length. Almost 99.99% .99 accurate. Is it clear? Then use for all materials. First use for one material, then use for second material, then use for third material, then use for fourth material, then use for fifth material. <laughs> Is it clear? <laughs> Do you understand the solution here? It was a lot conceptual. Okay. Anyway, okay, let's get give you a break. Is there anything that you do not understand so far? Good. Let's have a break of uh, five minutes and then we. Uh, now, once we have studied uh, the fins, okay, first we studied different type of fins, then we studied uh, the heat diffusion equation. We developed the heat diffusion equation for the fins, then we solved for different boundary conditions. Uh, we saw that uh, what could be the solution and all the solutions are there in the form of a table based upon what boundary condition we have and we solved it. Okay? So now we move forward and let's talk about fin performance. How do we, how do we study the performance of a fin? <coughs> Is a fin performing good, not good? How do we compare that? So we have uh, three terminologies for it. The first terminology is the fin effectiveness. Now, fin effectiveness is what? Fin effectiveness is the ratio. Okay, but the definition of these three terms I can ask you in the exam. Write down the definition of these three terms, okay? Or any definition. Or any one of them or them, okay? Anyways, uh, fin effectiveness. It is the ratio of the fin heat transfer rate to the heat transfer rate that would exist without the fin. So, the, what, what does it mean? It means you have. Uh, you have the main body. Uh, it means you have the main body, and this main body is going through the heat transfer. Okay, now you attach a fin to it, so the heat transfer would increase. Okay, so if uh, so, it's a ratio of heat transfer, fin heat transfer. That means over the fin, whatever the heat transfer. Suppose the heat transfer from the fin is QF. Suppose the heat transfer from the fin is QF. So that is QF divided by the heat transfer if the fin was not there. Suppose if the fin was not there, then the heat transfer would only be from this surface, right? Because of the fin heat transfer is from the complete surface of uh, so complete su uh, surface area of the fin. But if the fin was not there, then the heat transfer would only be from the base surface, okay? So it is. It will be what? It will be h cross section area of the base only okay base multiply by theta b temperature of base minus t infinity 
Is it clear? So fin, fin effectiveness is what? Heat transfer by the fin divided by heat transfer if the fin was not there. Okay. okay. So heat ratio. This is the ratio of two heat transfers. So it will be just a number, no unit. Okay. So heat transfer by the fin, actual fin. Suppose this is QF divided by heat transfer if the fin was not there. If the fin was not there, then the heat transfer would be only from this surface, right? So that is the base. So base will be H area, cross section area of the base. Here, this area. ACB into theta B, TB minus T infinity. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. What is this QF? This QF is, this QF is this. That's the heat transfer from the fin, right? The heat fin heat transfer rate, QF. Is it clear? Yes. So fin effectiveness is what? QF upon H A C B theta B. Do you understand this or not? So if you increase the area, this is that's mean the area of the fin, that's mean the, the heat transfer is uh, it will increase. QF will increase, yeah. effectiveness will increase. Uh, effectiveness. So normally this heat effectiveness should be greater than 2 or, m or much, much greater than 2, okay? If it is less than 2, then it's not acceptable. You are adding a fin so that the heat transfer rate should increase. The heat transfer rate should increase at least double, yeah, double. or more than double. In reality, in most of the cases, it is like 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? And then it makes sense. You are putting fin. Fin is an additional material, it will cost you money. So you are willing to put money only if the addition, addition in heat transfer is significant. If the addition is heat transfer is not significant, then what's the point? Okay? Is it clear? Yes. So that's the fin effectiveness. So suppose uh, for an infinite length long case, QF will be capital M then it will be m upon h a c b theta b or substitute the value of m and you get this thing is it clear so okay khalas. this is something you should read it yourself okay uh, then you have another term which is fin resistance Okay, so fin resistance is what? You, are, you, you have heat transfer from the fin is given by QF. Okay, so you know that QF is equals to theta uh, upon resistance of, uh, resistance of the fin. Okay, QF is equals to theta upon resistance of the fin. Uh, if it was a base, then resistance of the base would be what? So resistance of the base would be uh, Q from the base is equals to theta of the base divided by resistance of the base. Okay. So in case of uh, that the heat transfer rate, in case of the we we discussed. Uh, about the fin effectiveness, right? Fin effectiveness was what? QF upon HACB theta B. You can consider this HACB theta B as QB, the heat transfer from the base. So, so fin effectiveness was Q fin upon Q base. Fin effectiveness was Q fin upon Q base. In terms of the resistances, we can write fin effectiveness is equals to uh, resistance of the resistance of the base divided by resistance of the fin you see q and r are inversely proportional to each other okay q and r are inversely proportional to each other so if when q is up r will be down if you sub substitute and similarly when q is down r will be up okay so fin effectiveness can be represented in terms of the Q's, K 
can be represented in terms of the resistances. Resistance of the base, resistance of the fin. Now the idea is that, here if you see the equation, idea is that effectiveness will be high if the resistance of fin is low yes. and the resistance of the base is high. Okay? So that means our fin should be a material which is not offering much resistance. Our fin should be a material that should not offer much resistance. But that makes sense. You can make fin of a steel, of a copper, but if you make fin of wood, it will be very bad. Because wood will give you a lot of resistance to heat transfer. The heat will not be conducted to the fin. How will it be conducted out? So the resistance of the fin should be very less. Then the heat will be very quickly transferred to the fin and out. If the resistance of the fin is very high, then it's useless. That's why you cannot make fin of a wood. Wood gives very high resistance. Yeah, because of the K value. Is it clear? So this is one conceptual thing. Anyway. So most of the time, in reality, they are using the fin to gain the heat or to reject the heat? For both the cases we take, we do it. Most of the time we use it for reject heat. But for gaining heat, sometimes we also use it. Okay. Now the thing is that, as we know, that the temperature of the fin is not constant. So at the base, its temperature will be base. At the tip, its temperature would be temperature of the tip, or if adiabatic fin, then might be the temperature would be the same as the temperature of the surrounding. But throughout the this throughout any cross section, the temperature would vary with x. If you change x, temperature would vary. Okay, so finding out the heat transfer from the fin is not easy. So that's why, since the temperature is not constant, you have to use the formulas which were developed in the table there. Okay? But uh, in most of the applications, there are two temperatures which are almost fixed, almost known. And they are the temperature of the base, okay. not tip, and the temperature of the environment, T infinity. T base is normally known, T infinity is known, but the temperature of the complete fin from base to the tip is varying. Okay? So it will be much better if we can use the, the fixed temperatures. And the fixed temperatures are of base and infinity. Okay? They are not changing. So basically, what we do is that, okay, now the thing is that. Um, uh, there is a concept of uh, fin efficiency. Now, fin efficiency is different from fin effectiveness. Fin effectiveness was something else. Fin effectiveness was that how much is the heat transfer from the fin compared to how much will be the heat transfer if the fin was not there. Now, fin effect, fin eff that was fin effectiveness. What is fin efficiency? Fin efficiency says how much is the heat transfer from the fin compared to how much is the maximum possible heat transfer from the fin. How much is the heat transfer from the fin in reality divided by how much is the maximum possible heat transfer from the fin? Is it clear? Yes. So for the case of fin efficiency, we write it as QB, sorry, QF, which is the actual heat transfer from the fin divided by the maximum possible heat transfer from the fin. Now what is the maximum possible heat transfer from the fin? Suppose if we assume that the whole fin, fin is at base temperature. We know that the fin only here is at base temperature, but its temperature drop as we move away from the base. But let's assume that the, that the whole fin is at base temperature. Then the heat transfer would be maximum possible, right? the Carnot's heat transfer maximum possible heat transfer okay so in that case what will what it will be so in that case you will have uh, uh, h then the complete complete surface area of the fin so area surface okay area surface of fin let's call it af area of the fin surface area of the fin af let's call it that multiply by theta b because we assume that the complete fin is at temperature Tb, base temperature. 
Okay, so then this will give you Q max, right? So QF upon Q max will be the fin efficiency. Okay, fin efficiency must be less than hundred percent, must be less than one. Fin effectiveness must be greater than two. Okay, so that's QF upon Q max. Okay, now Q max uses the surface area of the fin which is easily uh, findable, measurable. You can measure how long is the fin. You can find out what is the surface area of the fin. H is normally known or we can find out H. Okay, theta B is also known because theta B means T B minus T infinity. T B is also fixed, T infinity is also fixed. Okay, so you can find Q F two ways. One way is that you can find QF using the tables. Other way is that you can find QF as NF efficiency of fin multiplied by Qmax. Qmax is easily known. And efficiency fin, if, if, some, if, if by somehow you know the efficiency of fin, it will be much easier to find QF than, you, than rather going back into the table and finding QF from the formulas there. Is it clear? So we have already developed figures which define the efficiency of fin for different fins. So instead of going back into the table of formulas, it's better to use these, these figures. These figures will give you efficiency of fin. If you know Qmax and efficiency of fin, it's very easy to find out the he actual heat transfer from the fin. Okay, And Qmax is easily known. Uh, TB is not changing, theta T infinity is not changing, area of the surface of the fin is known, H is known, so, so Q max is easily known. So Q max multiplied by the fin efficiency will give you QF. Okay, so that's the use of fin efficiency. So you, do you understand the concept here? Fin performance is determined by three factors. Yes. Fin effectiveness, yes. fin resistance, yes. fin efficiency. Fin efficiency must be less than 100 percent. It's not possible that the, the, yes. the, that the whole fin be at temperature, base temperature. So it should be less than 100 percent. Fin effectiveness must be greater than 2. If it is less than 2, then the, the fin is useless. Okay? Um, fin resistance is the ratio of resistances. Okay. Now how do we determine it? How do we determine uh, the efficiency, it is through these graphs, okay? Suppose if you have an annular fin, suppose if you have an annular fin, so you find this term, you find this term, then you go into the, ta into the graph, come to the point where it is cutting the, the, the graph curve, then go uh, horizontal, find out what is the efficiency. Is it clear? Yes. Now, Just a minute, let me uh, see if I can, yes. Now if you see here, for example, if you have a fin which is annular, then you have to use this graph, okay? Then you need to find the x-axis first. Now what is x-axis written here? Look at the x-axis. The x-axis is LC, this is not L. LC, corrected length. It's going to take into consideration the tip heat transfer. Okay, corrected length power three by two H upon K AP uh, power half. Now AP is what? We don't know. LC, what will be the formula for LC? We know, but it is written here. AP is equals to LC into T. Okay, now it is shown here, what is T? T is the thickness of the fin. Okay, uh, R1 is the radius. Okay, R2 is uh, so R1 is the radius from the center to the to the start of the fin to the base. R2 is the radius from the center to the end of the fin yes. fin tip. Okay, L is the length of the fin. Okay, and LC is what LC is L plus T by two. Okay. So if you know the thickness, you can find what is LC. 
If you know the thickness and if you know L, you'll find LC. If you know LC, you'll find AP. Okay? If you know AP, LC, H, K, you will find this term. Then you go into the graph and see where you have to meet. Now where you have to meet depends upon R2C upon R1. That's the two radiuses. R1 is what? R1 is the radius from the center to yeah. the base. Okay? okay? R2C is R2 plus T by 2. R2 is the complete radius till the tip plus T by 2 is R2C. So you will find out what is R2C by 1 for your case. And if it is 1, if it is 2, if it is 3, if it is 5, if it is, if it is 4, then you go in, in between the two curve. Intersect it, go back here, uh, go, go in the horizontal direction, find out what is the efficiency. Then use that efficiency value. Is it clear? Yes. That is for the case of the annular fin. Suppose you don't have annular fin. Suppose you have a straight fin. If you have a straight fin, then straight fin could be of uniform cross-section. This is for uniform cross-section. This is for non-uniform cross-section. For non-uniform cross-section, you could have like this one. You can have like this one. Okay? For all the cases, it's given what is LC, what is AP? What is LC here? What is AP here? What is LC here? What is AP here? Right? These LC and AP you, ne you need to put here to get the value. Okay? So substitute the values here, intersect the curve, go horizontal, find out what is the efficiency. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So, is the corrected length. Is it clear? So, so by this way, so by using these graphs, you can actually find out what is the efficiency. Yeah. So if you know the efficiency multiply by Q max, you will find out what is the actual heat transfer from the fin. Which is QF. Is it clear? This is just the same thing explained uh, why we are using the corrected length. This is just the description written here. But I have already explained to you because we need to take into account the tip heat transfer. That's why we use the corrected length. Okay. Uh, let's go through yourself. This is a small derivation. Anyways, we have uh, multiple formulas for it. For the case of uh, straight fins, they, you have the graph as well as you have the, the graph are made up of curves. Those curves have been formulated here as well in the, in the terms of formulas. So you, get the val you can get the value from the curve or you can get the value from the formula. Both possible, okay? So you have is for a straight fin. If th this is the kind of a straight fin, if this is a triangular fin, if this is a parabolic fin, so, so how would you find the efficiencies? This is the efficiency here. Uh, sorry. This is the efficiency here. This is the efficiency for this case. This is the efficiency for the, this case. Okay. Then if you have circular fin, this is circular fin, annular fins. Okay. So it's coming from, from a radius, from the center of the pipe. Then this is the pin fin. If you have pin fin, for pin fin, you do not have any graph. Okay, you have the graph for the, for, for the straight fin or for the annular fin, but pin fin, you do not have any graph. So pin fin, if you have rectangular, if you have triangular pin fin, if you have parabolic pin fin, so these are the formulas through which you can find out the efficiencies. That's it. So we stop here today, and uh, we're going to start from uh, overall fin efficiency, fin array, in the next class. Inshallah, next class we are going to finish chapter number three. So three, we are almost uh, at which slide? Uh, yeah. So we are already at slide number seventy-five. Fifteen more slides, and inshallah, we are going to finish chapter number three, and uh, then we move towards chapter number four. Is it clear? First of all, let me know. Uh, is whatever whatever we are going through, I know it is too much, and 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 you will see that things are going to become more and more heavy in future. But for 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 me, important thing is that are you able to understand it or not? Yes, yes. So far, what we are doing. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.